Hey, I'm Caleb with You Can Make This Too, and today's video is all about circular saw blades. As I'm sure you gathered, this isn't just about this kind of circular saw blade, but rather all saws that use circular blades, miter saws, and table saws too. Probably not going to talk about radial arm saws because it's not 1985 anymore. But anyway, first we'll start with the basics of blade geometry, kind of why they're different for different kinds of cuts and combo blades. And then I'll talk about some of the latest cutting edge technology in blades. Sorry, I had to do that one. And then also wrap up with some of the differences between less expensive and more expensive blades and some tips to keep your blades lasting longer and get your money out of them. A common question I've been asked is which saw blade to use for what? Fortunately, most manufacturers and retailers make this super easy right now because they literally tell you right on the blade. So whenever you see the blades, all you need to know is what size blade your saw takes. Go there, find that size, and look on the blade for the one that says it cuts the things you want to cut. It's really that easy. But um, you're here because you want to know a little bit more than that. Like, what are the differences? Why? What if you've got some old blades that maybe it's worn off of? Well, if uh, all the labels worn off your blade, it's probably dull and you need to throw it away and go buy a new one. But let's get into why blades are the way they are. So the first thing you'll probably notice about these are the size difference. Of course, you just pair whatever size blade you need to the size blade that your saw takes. Next is probably color. These are all red, but you see these are white. These are Diablo branded, whereas these are Ford Industrial. Diablo is a division of Freud. This is just the, more their consumer line. This is their professional line. And getting a little more nuance, the next thing you'll notice is the tooth counts. This is a high tooth count, a lower tooth count, and how many teeth are on a blade is one of the biggest differences in how it's going to perform. These are lower tooth count blades. This is my ripping blade, and in a table saw, you normally have a lower tooth count blade when you're doing ripping because of uh, fiber orientation. Well, I'll get into that later. Um, but for the framing blades, they also have a lower tooth count because with less teeth, the blade will take a more aggressive cut and cut faster. So you can see this is a framing blade. So the idea is here, this would be used for pine. You're not looking for a really precise, fine cut. You're just trying to hog through some material quickly so you can cut the thousand two by fours you need to to build a house or whatever. And this is their fast framing blade, which is 18 tooth, but this is a five and a half. This is a six and a half blade. So if you look, the amount of teeth around is actually pretty close. This, these teeth are just a little bit closer than this one, but as far as, you know, how many cuts it's going to take, it's pretty similar. Okay, that's all cool, but why does the tooth count make a difference depending on which way you're cutting through wood? Well, that has to do with the wood grain. Here's a piece of walnut, and it's really easy to see the grain on this, especially because we have a little piece of pith, which was the center of a tree or the branch, whatever this was. See all the rings growing out and how those rings kind of form lines going down. Now, if we're cutting down along these lines, that would be ripping. And this is a common analogy, but imagine all these, this grain, all these little fibers was a bundle of straws. What we're trying to do basically is sever these straws from each other and this end because these are bendy straws actually can help so you can see that you know just kind of breaking the bond between the straws or the fibers is really easy so we can move through that a little quicker and also whenever we sever this you know we're going to have kind of a long little piece so we need more space between our teeth a larger gullet which is achieved when you have lesser spacing to accommodate those slightly larger particles as we're cutting through. Contrast that with cross cutting, we're cutting across the grain, right? Now our bundle of straws is running this way. So we're no longer trying to separate the straws from each other. Instead, we're trying to shear through these fibers and separate little pieces of it. So we really want to, if we want a clean cut, we need to really nibble through this nice and slow which is where our cross-cut saw is going to come in. And because we're going slower and also getting smaller particles, because I'm just going to chip out a little bit of this, I'm not going to be able to, you know, break off a longer piece easy, I don't need as much clearance, so I can have a smaller gullet. Also, that's why those different grind techniques come in, because with the angle, uh, the ATB kind of grind and TCG, the, the tri-trip grind and whatnot, that angle is gonna help sever through these fibers to get a cleaner cut versus that, you know, 
hacking flat grind, which would be fine for just chipping out along the length, but not as good if you're trying to sever through the fibers, not them from each other. One of the cool things about moving to the pro level table saw blades is they normally tell you exactly what kind of grind uh, the blade has right on the blade that's good for resharpening and also because once you're at this level that matters to you I'm going to go over what some of these mean that my ripping blade is a flat tooth grind Which is exactly what you think it is It means the top of the blade or tooth is flat and that gives you a flat bottom cut Which makes this really useful not just for ripping but doing joinery So if you're trying to use this to make rabbits or dados or grooves You're gonna have a flat bottomed groove which is a really good feature on my thin kerf cross cut, I have an ATB, which is an alternating top bevel, which is a very common type of grind. You'll see that on, that's kind of the standard grind on most blades. You see if you have a framing blade or anything, it's probably an ATB. And that basically means every tooth has an angle on the top and they alternate, alternating top bevel. You can really see the difference between the flat bottom blade and the cross cut. So if I needed to make this wider and make multiple cuts, this would be flat, whereas, as you can see, that would be ridged. But something you'll notice is this tooth, like the rip saw tooth, is still ground perpendicular to the blade, which is how most are ground. And this is where the difference between the cross cut and plywood blades really come in. This has an axial shear and a high ATB. So it's still that alternating top bevel, but it's a more severe angle a, a greater bevel than this is and that helps give this type of tooth more of a shearing action which results in less tear out on the thin veneer on plywood because it helps get that leading edge of the tooth out there a little bit farther in the cut to score the veneer before the rest of the tooth comes through and that's what minimizes the tear out. The other thing you'll notice is instead of the tooth grind being perpendicular to the blade as most of them are, it actually is angled a little bit and that's what the axial shear is, which again helps get the leading cutting edge of that tooth out there to score the material and also helps provide a shearing action instead of a cutting or tearing action on the veneer on plywood because this blade doesn't know if you're running cross across the grain on the veneer or with the grain on the veneer. So either way, this will help make sure that you get the least amount of tear out on a piece of plywood on that really thin veneer. But if this blade is so good at, you know, minimizing tear out, etc., why have a crosscut blade? Why not just make this and only use this? Well, a few reasons. First, I think this was actually a little bit more expensive because it has a more advanced grind on it. Also, this grind is a lot more aggressive and so it's going to dull a little bit quicker on hardwoods. This is going to have a little bit more durability, so it's just optimized for cutting hardwoods. This will absolutely give you a really good cross cut, but there's so much more built into this that you don't need if you're just cross cutting hardwoods. So using this one, I'm going to keep my plywood blade good for plywood and laminates longer than if I use this for all cross cutting and plywood laminates. There's several surfaces that are ground and different faces that can be cut at different angles and each of those has a specific name that they're addressed by and then the degree so you can compare blades. I'm not going to get into all the terms, but one thing I am going to talk about is the hook angle, which is one term that is important. Fortunately, hook angle is easy to see and understand. If I use this rule to just kind of draw the diameter, you can see how this tooth cants forward a little bit. And this positive angle makes for a slightly aggressive cut because the tooth is leaning in into the cut, basically. And this is the way most blades are made for circular saws and table saws. But that more aggressive cut is not ideal at a miter saw, especially a sliding miter saw. To understand why that's bad at the sliding miter saw, a close look at the circular saw, which is the same way table saw cuts, is very informative. Now on the circular saw, the blade rotates this way and the leading cutting edge is here. And if these teeth are pushing on the wood in any way, it's pushing this way against the plate. And you can imagine this upside down, same way a table saw works, where the blade pulls it down against the table instead of the shoe. But at the miter saw, as you know, the cut often starts in the middle of the board. This is why the negative rake angle is important. As you can see, that tooth isn't aggressively shoved into it. With this negative rake, what that helps it do is the blade provides downward and rearward force to help hold 
the piece in place. It also means for a slower, less aggressive cut so the saw doesn't get away from you. And this also helps prevent self-feeding. With a positive rake angle, if those two teeth were canted forward more, this blade might have the tendency to try to dig itself into the wood and you know this blade and motor are going to overpower you and it's going to happen faster than you can react. So this is much safer. Of course, at the circular saw and table saw, we want the opposite. That's why we have the positive hook angle. I have my crosscut blade on top. You can see how it has a little bit, and underneath it is my rip blade. You can see it has a more aggressive hook angle, and that is for just that reason to get a more aggressive cut, a faster cut. It helps pull itself into the wood and helps hold that board down against the table as you're cutting or against your saw. Now, if you're savvy with miter saws, you know on wider boards, or really any board if you can, it's better to do a scoring pass and cut the top and then come through and cut the bottom. Here's why. As we can see here, the leading edge of the cutting is actually happening down. The negative rake angle helps that happen because if that tooth was counted forward, it would be happening on the back side. Now because the cutting action is happening down, that's pushing the wood fibers down instead of lifting them up, which helps minimize tear out. So that's what we want to do on the top is get that. Whereas if we try to cut this in one pass, like this, you can see then on the top side, those teeth will be cutting up and ripping up those fibers and we'll get tear out. So we'll want to score the top, come through, and then cut the bottom. And our tendency sometimes is to do exactly that because we think, okay, enter the cut, cut out, go down, cut back. That's actually kind of dangerous. The negative hook helps prevent um, bad things from happening, but better technique is better. Because of the blade rotation, if we're going this way, we're going with the saw blade, and that can make the saw want to run away, especially if you hit a knot or something hard or metal in the wood. So it's always better, you want to come out here and start, go through and do your score cut, then come back again and do your score cut. And there you go. If you didn't know that, you're welcome because you're going to get much better cuts with less tear out. Just remember, score cut, come through, then final cut. And not only is that going to give you better cuts, it's also safer if you start at the front of the board and work your way back both times. I'm no like genius here. This is actually in the operator's manual and it tells you all those things. But uh, like me, you probably threw it away before you read it. And latest developments, you know, new cutting edge tech. Sorry for the bad puns. Um, most blades, regular wood blades, uh, they don't recommend it and I don't really advise it. it can cut through aluminum and soft metals. Okay, non-ferrous metals, it's not great for it, but they can. But you really want to avoid steel or anything hardened, it's just not going to do it. But Diablo has some proprietary material, it's, I think for the Steel Demon it's like um, a ceramic carbide blend or something, but this blade goes into regular wood cutting circular saw and you can cut stainless steel steel. I bought this when I did the Kitchen Island about a year ago and cut a bunch of steel angle iron. It's pretty wild. So if you don't want to invest in metal saws but you want to cut metal with your woodworking tools, these kind of blades will do it. Just make sure the RPM on your saw and the RPM is um, lower than the max RPM on your blade. And after they have, with the Steel Demon tech, they put some of that in some different blades. These are wood and metal blades, which are amazing for demolition. And the idea is it's optimized for cutting not just metal, because you want a different tooth geometry for just metal. These do okay in wood, but they'll also chug through any nails or metal debris that's in wood, and you don't have to worry about your carbide, you know, exploding and ended up ending up in your body or anything, which is amazing. And it's not like a slow, painful, if you've ever accidentally hit a nail with a circular saw, you know, like, oh man, I hit it. And then it's that moment of do a power through or stop or whatever. This, you don't even notice there's a nail. It's, it's pretty crazy. Now talk about the less expensive versus the more expensive versions of blades and what you get. Now I like Ford and Diablo because they tend to have um, good features and that's not because Home Depot is sponsoring this and sent me some. You've seen 10 different Ford Diablo blades. They gave me three. The other seven and I have more in my drawers I've paid for. So that's just what I like. And unfortunately I don't have any of the Diablo branded table saw blades, but this pretty well holds true. 
These are all laser cut, which is more precise than stamped blades, but you can see there isn't a whole lot of laser cutting. Once you step up, you have more laser cutting, and what that is, it just helps minimize vibrations, or the amount of the design that goes into the more expensive blades is more, but the main difference is the size of the carbide. Now, circular saw to table saw isn't apples to apples, but you'll notice these circ saw blades have really small carbide pieces, but these Freud Industrial have much larger carbide pieces, and you can compare them in the store from the expensive to less expensive, and you'll notice the same thing. The more expensive have much larger carbide, and the reason for that is to allow resharpening. So that way when you drop 70, 80, 100, 100 plus dollars on a blade, you're not doing that every time. Then what you do is pay 10 to $15 and get that blade resharpened and get several uses out of it. Whereas the 20 to $30 table saw blades you see are more of not necessarily one-time use, but single use in the sense of once that blade's dull, there's just not enough carbide there to be resharpened and maintain all the proper angles. So you chuck that one and buy a new blade. A great tip that I haven't done great keeping up on to keep your blades cutting well. If you, if they're not quite cutting right, but you don't think they should be dull yet, or even if they seem a little dull, a lot of times cleaning will actually get the performance um, back up. I actually have this little cleaning kit that works really well, but a 10 inch blade will fit inside of a five gallon bucket, so you can use that. But if you don't have a good space, there's another cool trick for cleaning blades. Just use a fluffy towel or some moving blankets and a trash bag would be a lot better. These, these aren't quite big enough, had a double over. But that'll give you a little indention where whatever you're using to clean will work. And vinegar is okay, simple green, even dish detergent, something mild because you don't want anything that's going to uh, strip the coating off. And if you do use like vinegar or something, just uh, don't let them soak more than a few minutes because you can start to eat away whatever coatings might be on your blade. Yeah, then a soft brush, get all that gum and debris off and your blades will start cutting a lot better. Personally, I prefer dedicated specialty blades over combination blades or multi-purpose blades, but it's totally fine. Normally for a table saw and a 10 inch blade, you're looking at like a 40 tooth combination blade. And the idea is those are designed to strike a balance between ripping okay and cross cutting okay. And some of them people will say they have really good results with. Personally, I think it takes like 10 seconds to change a saw blade. And normally I'm batching my work, so I don't normally go rip cross, rip cross. It's like a bunch of ripping, then a bunch of cross cutting, or then plywood. So I have no problem just setting the blade in that I need and changing it when it's time to change it to get the best performance at each of those tasks. But if you, you would rather go combination blade, that's totally cool. You do you. Another question I get sometimes, which kind of goes with the, hey, what tools should I buy is, well, which blades should I buy? Um, like I said, I like specialty blades, so buy the blade for whatever task you have. Don't go and just stock up on blades because I might need that someday. Just wait till you do need it and get it then. And as far as what I leave in my saw, it's really based on your shop and what you work with the most. At my table saw is where I do most of my finish cuts and ripping, so I normally either have my plywood blade in there or my ripping blade. I got my crosscut blade before I got a miter saw set up, so you know um, I did my crosscutting at the table saw. Now I do all my crosscutting at the miter saw, and I have a fine tooth, 72 tooth crosscut blade in my miter saw that stays there. In my circular saw, I normally have my plywood blade because most of the times I use my circular saw to break down plywood large sheets until I take it to the table saw. If I'm breaking down dimensional goods, I use, normally use my jigsaw for that. But occasionally, you know, I'll throw a framing blade or the steel demon or the wooden metal blade in here if that's what I need for a certain task. Hope you enjoyed this or at least learned something. Here's a link to some videos that you might find interesting. If you like this one, if you feel like I earned it, please don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification bell so YouTube actually lets you know whenever I let out the next video. And until next time, make time to make something.